All right, Tom, Crawl Space Medic, uh, here to feed you and talk to you about crawl spaces. Uh, so here we go. The biggest thing, first of all, have any of you lost any deals because of the crawl space? No, close to you. Yeah, close. Mm -hmm. So it happens. Well, a crawl space is one of those things that you know you just got a door on it and you never go into it. But why would you, right? Unless you get a problem. Uh, we do recommend that you have it inspected about once a year. Sometimes once every six months if you got a dehumidifier kind of thing. So you want to go down there and make sure it's working. Uh, biggest issue with crawl space is moisture. Wood moisture. This is a picture of a meter here. Twenty two point two percent. If you're above 20%, you're in the range to get um, fungal growth and, and then you start to get rot. Um, and how often do you see that out there inspecting houses? Like, uh, every all, other crawl space. Every sorry. other crawl space, right. Sorry, yeah. adding someone on here. She She's in Lynchburg. Lynchburg. Somebody there we go. Okay. Should be good. I don't Is it going to the next slide? Let me go back real quick. But yeah, so really 20, if you think about 20, 21%, some of the first things you check is wood moisture. You start getting fungal growth, the white wood destroying fungal growth, that kind of thing. Hundreds of thousands of different types of mold, fungal growth, all that stuff. Uh, 10 to 15% is where you want to be. You don't want to go too much lower than that. You get below 8%, you can start having some issues with wood being too dry. I've seen that before. Um, especially if somebody got a dehumidifier, they're like, oh, I want it, you know, I want it drier. They go down there, home it goes down there. Next thing you know, cracking, popping, you got you got some different issues, right? Um, but eight, 16 to 19 percent, you can you can get away with for a while, but it, it'll eventually, eventually get you with some, some wood rot. Um, but you don't really have to worry too much about the fungal. Now, this next one, this is the, the wood destroying that white step of wood destroying the fungal growth. Um, it was about, I think that house was about 60 years old. It's hard to tell when it it gets really bad. I mean, you can go down there. It seems like you start to get it. And then a couple of years, like the worse it gets, the worse it gets faster kind of a thing. Um, so that wood destroying fungal growth, what happens is just the wood gets soft if you don't dry it out. And this particular beam, this is a, a customer's main beam had to be cut out and replaced. So you, I think that was... And there's, I don't know if you see behind it, there's another beam behind it that's got the same issues. So it was it was definitely a different type of build where you had the foundation on the outside and you had two beams in the middle and you actually had joists running in between the middle. So it was it was kind of set up for, for a very expensive job. Um, so again, the 20% wood moisture content and staying below that is very important. Typically, you want the, the moisture in the air, the humidity around 50 to 55 percent, you'll be okay. Um, but, you know, 45 to 55, you're in good shape. So, again, don't want to go too low because you don't want to want to dry it out. But the only way you can do that is with the dehumidifier. Yeah. How you, so, how do you keep it a certain percentage? How do you know what to do? Well, the dehumidifiers. So they 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 turn an on and off, right? So you can say I said dehumidifier fifty percent. Typically, always start at fifty percent, um, and that'll typically get you between ten and fifteen percent wood moisture content. There have been times where we come across something I've seen it where the wood moisture is forty percent. I mean, it's just it's wet, right? You don't want to go in there and just crank that thing on, right? You want to go in there, set it at sixty five percent, let it dry out, come back a week later. Take it down five to ten percent, let it dry out. It, it, it takes a long time for things to get wet. You don't want to dry them out overnight. Yeah. Uh, because the dehumidifier will, I've seen, you know, go from 30% to 20% in a week. You know, so you can you can dry them out fairly quickly. Uh, but again, this is this is where I like to talk to people and educate them because this is a you know, 20, 30 thousand dollar job when you build this house, you put a good vapor barrier in it, the dehumidifier, you're looking at 3,500 bucks and you just don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. You know, except the dehumidifier, you gotta change the filter once a year kind of thing, but it's, you know, I'd rather pay the 3,500 bucks. So every call space you need to be 
out here, I would say, if I had to put a number on it, I'd say 95%. Absolutely. I, I went into a house in Virginia Beach, I inspected a house in Virginia Beach about two months ago. 20 year old house, no fungal growth. No, I've never seen that before. There was no fungal growth, original vapor barrier, perfect. The house was perfect. Never, that's the only time that's ever happened in two years that I've seen that. House next door, fungal growth, complete disaster. Hmm. Every house is different. Um, I, I see it all the time. Some neighborhood, you know, neighbors are telling other neighbors, like, you don't need a dehumidifier. My house is fine. Yeah, we'll go on to her house, right? It's not fine. Mm -hmm. Every house is different, uh, especially if you have, so if you've got a, a clearance from the dirt to the wood, the, the larger that is, the better it is. Okay, because of the, obviously the lower you are to it, water evaporates, that's where the vapor barriers for it gets into the wood very quickly. So you got good ventilation down there. So to answer your question, I that easily 90, 95% of the houses out here, I, I think, need a demon fire. Mm -hmm. And sure. if one doesn't have one, what's the cost? Um, it depends on the size of the house. Let's say anything under 2,000 square feet, you need an electrician, right? You need an outlet down there, which is going to run you between. Four and six hundred bucks, and then dehumidifier, the Santa Fe's that we sell, compact seventies, um, are running about eighteen hundred bucks with a condensate pump. And as the, we use those specifically because they have a six-year warranty on. They're the only ones in the industry I know to do that. Typically, they're one to three years uh, warranty. Hey, uh, yeah. For uh, discussing the debris and how the wood is sitting, um, you got to tell pay for. Even if they quoted them three thousand. Well, yes, eighteen hundred is that just for the material, not that's better. so that's installed the dehumidifier and cotton comes with a condensate pump if that's needed. Um, but the electrician, they probably do who do you know what company it was? Allegiant Pest. Allegiant Pest. They they might have their own electrician. You yeah. know what I mean? So that's probably in the quote. Um yeah. and, and finding a good electrician can be difficult, right? right. So that's we we do outsource that because we're not licensed electricians. Right. So I've, I've got a couple of numbers of electricians I trust. Mm -hmm. uh, been through a lot of electricians. Yeah. Yeah. Well, electricians North Carolina, but probably right. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. 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 More North Carolina too. Okay. A little a little different market down there for sure. Right. Um. So yeah, that's probably something similar. You're talking about the joists that needed to be. Like all sisters, yeah, probably had a lot to do with some wooden strong fungal growth. Now, something like that. Would you sister or would you like jack the house up in places? Well, we don't so we don't jack houses up. Mm -hmm. We can we can level out floors to some degree, kind of take you know, that cupping floor. We can get that kind of you know flattened out. We don't guarantee it's gonna be level. Um, but no, we don't. It kind of comes back to you know, this house has been steadily for 20, 30, 40 years. We don't want to jack it up and then day try to fix it, right? It, it causes more problems. Mm -hmm. but we don't we don't even get into it. Um, so yeah, so something like that. So this is the main beam right here. The joists, which was very interesting, were fine in this house. So it was just the beam. The joists were fine, and, and just the beam needed to be replaced. Um, mm -hmm. So what we have to do is we build on either side of those beams. Um, typically, in this case, you have to take that beam out, but typically we leave the original beam in because if it's not hurting anything being there, we just leave it in there. Um, but again, even after that, you still want to install a dehumidifier because you, now you got new wood down there that's with some wood that's rotten, so you want to, you still want to keep it dry. Um, yeah, that's that's that out here. It's just the humidity out here is just so bad. Uh, it's uh, it's good to have a dehumidifier, and I I, I really would like to get a hold of a lot of builders that build new houses and, and get a dehumidifier in there because it would save people so much money down the line. Um, it's it's crazy. You have any more questions about that? Like we're just trying fungal growth, anything like that? What's the general timeline for like? If someone wasn't, they didn't have anything down there, how long right. would it take for it to get to that point? Oh man, it's it depends on the house. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, you know, I went to the house in Virginia Beach, it was like a, no fungal growth or nothing after 20 years. Um, I've been in new houses six months old that already have fungal growth. Do you, you think know? it can go to like the crawl space vents, like the specific vents they have to like the ones that open and close or the ones that so here, and that's an interesting question because I run into a lot of people that are like, oh, I, I leave them open during the summer, 
closing during the winter. I'm like, stuff. just either leave them open all year, right? Or get a dehumidifier and close them. Those, those are the two options, right? I, I come across people think, oh, I talk to so-and-so. I hear this every day. And it's like, stop, stop talking to each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Leave them open or close them. Could they the sell them on the open and close, right? Yeah, it's just you're blowing hot, wet air around, man. Right. I guess that's all you're doing. And, and it's so really, when I mean, you think about it, it gets wet. And this is what a lot of people do. They close them during wintertime. But really, during winter, when it's cold and dry, after it's been wet, you want that cold, dry air to go through your crawl space and dry it out. Mm -hmm. So what people are doing is it just has actually made it worse. So they're just trapping moisture inside of the crawl space during the winter. And it, and it's it's tough because people tell me, oh, it's been fine for 10, 15 years. I don't know what happened. And it's like, well, man, your car's fine for 10, 15 years, too. So it's not. Yeah. You know, and that's just the mindset of it's been built. Now it's done. It's like, no, we got to. Water tables right yeah, water table rising. I've been to houses out. We do sub pumps mm -hmm. out in Hampton, one of the worst places I've ever been with <laughs> with water. Is I mean, we ended up installing three or four pumps and say, can't now you can't even pump it anymore. And we're gonna pump it to the streets higher than the house. And bad situations, right? So wow. we we do drains, we do pumps, that kind of thing. But there's sometimes where it's like, you know, what are you gonna do? You can't pump it. Your neighbor's house, it'll be bad. Uh, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. Pump it to your neighbor's house and give my car. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, the wood, the, the water is, and that's the thing too. A lot of people, I just need a drain if they got a lot of water coming in. If it's not coming in from the outside perimeter of your home, a drain is not going to help you because it's coming up to the ground. You know, so it's coming to the ground in the middle of the crawl space. The drain on the perimeter isn't doing anything for you. So there's a lot of big difference of, you know, you get heavy rain. Mm -hmm. And when you get water in the crawl space, that's different than I got a lot of brown water. There's been houses where you dig three, four inches down in the water. It's not wet in the water, you know? So it's a, it's a totally different animal um, to deal with. Um, yeah. So say we get a listen, right? And it's like mm -hmm. right there at the 20%. What would you suggest? Like, what do we tell them? Um, so here's it. So how, how often have you heard someone say your wood moisture is 15% or 20%? See what I what I hear is oh, I got I have high moisture in my car. Okay. And I, I never hear, you know, what does that mean? And I and, and that's what we get called is why well, high moisture in the crawl space. Well, how high is it? You know, and that's a lot of a lot of in, in like uh termite companies that got high moisture. We got high moisture, you can tell because you got fun with it. Okay. They know there's high moisture. Exactly how high is it? You don't really know until you test it. So if you had like a a client with you're really looking for more the what happens at the higher wood moisture which is going to alert you to you have high moisture like you have fungal growth that kind of a thing mm -hmm. you're going to know it gets above 20 percent and that's the other challenge of you know you go during winter and it's like well if it's 16 percent why do i have fungal growth well it's like because it's summer winter right okay. gets wet dries out gets wet dries out do that for 15 20 years it stops drying out <laughs> and then you get dry rock, right? So, yeah. So, so I would, so if you had somebody with fungal growth, you know, it's, and, and what I tell people too, not, you know, if I talk to a lot of inspectors, um, is, and a lot of homeowners, is have your home inspected first, you know, buy a licensed inspector, because I'm going to come in and say, yeah, you need to do this, 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 and this. A home inspector is going to come in. Maybe we're on the same page. Maybe we're not. Maybe it's you know this is more important than that, and that's what's going to matter. Okay. You know, if you're trying to sell a house, that's what. If you call me and give me a a, re a report, this is what's wrong. This is what needs to be fixed. That is what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like the inspection is done in my mind, okay. and that and that's what we stick to. So, you know, if a, if a client had high wood moisture, you would definitely want you, you got to dry it out. Okay. Um, but you know, getting people to pay for dehumidifiers when you're selling, yeah, you know, it okay. could be tough. <laughs> um, do you see any rental dehumidifiers out there? No, yeah. and that I've run into that too. People are like, Oh, I dried it out last year. It's like, Well, you got to keep it down there, you know. Uh, okay. So, it, and it's actually a lot less expensive. I see them rent them out for like a thousand bucks a week, 650, a thousand bucks a week. I'm like, they get you one. I'm like, Wow, wow. yeah, for, for but the interesting thing is, like, insurance companies will pay for that. Mm -hmm. wow. They'll pay four or five grand for some rental dehumidifier for a month. I'm like, I could sell you one for eighteen hundred bucks. I see air movers, but never been used. 
Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is something else to look out for. Uh, this is actually a house in Elizabeth City. So this house, you already started taking the deck off. This was built right up against the sill of the house. So when that deck got wet, so did the, the sill, which is basically the beam that is on the outside of the uh, the foundation, right? So you got your you got your sill, and you got your brick, and the house that's on top of it. So that rotted out. That, this is the the opposite. That's what's on the inside of it, right there. And then you got some real handy plumbing and electrical work that happened on the other side of that. But that's something to look out for. If you don't have a gap in between that deck and the house there's more than likely going to be issues on the other side of that. You got any questions about that? I have a question about that bottom clearly. Yeah, that's a beam. Same is it house. A, is it an ivy? It looks like an engineered. No, hey, it's not. It's not. It's just because it's brushing. And it looks like this is, it's like they had another, like a, a two by two or something like here that it was sitting on. Yep, exactly. But that's the same house. It's the exact same house. So that thing. That's just from that's incredible. It's crazy. It shows compressions too. It shows yeah. It was, oh, it's crushing. Yeah. Like it, so it's, that's something that we like. It's not, oh, we're just going to dry it out. It's good to go. <laughs> <laughs> you got to look for dry <laughs> Exactly. And that actually, this particular house in the quote was about 50K. The house is worth like 108. Home oh, my God. Like, you know, hair down. Exact below. That's it. Oh, my God. Yeah. So. It's sad though, man. Like people like this guy just retired, you know what I mean? And it's like I knew I needed some work done down there, had like eight or nine grand saved for him. And is the insurance able to cover any of that? Or no, they wouldn't cover So let me guess you just spray foam the entire call face and sold the house. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> just spray painted it. There you go. It's all good. Good. Don't look down there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's I mean, it, it's it's a bummer. You know, the guy that you know he wanted to actually stay in the house, but it's uh, this is what happens. And again, it comes right back to the dehumidifier in the crawl space. Yeah. It's, you know, two, three grand, four grand at the most. Mm -hmm. And then you're fine. You know, you're not dealing with, like losing your house. Like that's what we're talking about. People losing their homes that they've been in for mm -hmm. 20, 30 years mm -hmm. uh, because no one's been in the crawl space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a bummer. And then also with the, the deck, uh, building it right up against the house like that is never a good idea. So that's a good thing. Like if you're selling a house, that's something to you know it may not be looking too great on the inside um, if you don't have that gap in between that that deck and the ceiling. Do you run into that a lot, mm -hmm. or lack of flashing? The black, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. That'll do it. So dehumidifier. This is this is lady's house. You you probably recognize this, but that insulation is actually in upside down. Um, it was actually a refinance, right? So she got a quote uh, from a couple of different companies, five six grand kind of thing. It's a three hundred square foot little portion. The rest of the house is slab. Um, we we got her that for I think it was twenty two hundred bucks, something like that, and we got her got her the paperwork, refinance paperwork, and we're done. You know, so. That's the kind of stuff I like to do. Like it's just you're in and out. You help somebody, you know, get get the money that they're trying to refinance out of their house without breaking the bank, you know. So it's it's uh it's it's well worth the mass, what I like to do. And then on this side, we we use 10 mil typically, vapor barrier. We do 12 and 20. However, if if you don't have like a rocky you know, round in your crawl space, you're probably just going to stick with the 10. Um, 20 is typically when you're, you know, you got a wheelbarrow, you got a basement or something, you're going to be in there storing things. You want 20 mil, but 10 mil does the trick, uh, 25 year warranty on it. Um, and it just, it, it does the trick. So much better than the six mil. We do do six mil. I like to do it, but we both do it just because it's a little cheaper. That picture on the right. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't happen every time. That was a really flat, yeah, brown. You know what I mean? Like almost like not sandy either, because you've been in the sand and you put it out, and then you like anytime you put your knee in it, right it gets pretty annoying. <laughs> it doesn't look anywhere near that good, but no, it's uh. And the other thing is too, like you see the encapsulation where the piers are wrapped. We typically don't wrap piers. It's it's a little overkill. So you can see here where. 
See that water is right there? Like that's how, that's how much water's kind of soaking into that, the dampness. If that was going halfway up to that pier, I'd probably wrap it. Um, other than that, it, it's kind of a waste of money in my opinion. So if you wrap it, you should get a dehumidifier still? Or why not? You should never do an encapsulation unless you put a dehumidifier down there. Okay. So that that means, what that, what that means, more or less, you're sealing off your vents, right? So there's encapsulation, semi-encapsulation. If you close your vents to your house, Better have a dehumidifier down there, and I've I run into that. I've seen encapsulations where I have a dehumidifier. You know, that's that's a pretty important aspect of, of the encapsulation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, so you just got to control that environment down there. You're in good shape. So, so that and that's what the vapor barrier does is keeping that ground that groundwater that moisture from evaporating um, and getting getting into that that wood structure. Any questions about that at all? All right, so any type of seed damage, number one cause of those water, right? Whether it's coming from the outside, whether it's a plumbing leak, always moisture. And you always come right back and just get the dehumidifier. You know, whether it doesn't matter if it's air, uh, if you got a plumbing leak, it's a little different story, right? But um, it will keep your crawl space dry and healthy. And also about 40 to 60% of your air comes from the crawl space. So you got to put your bubble growth. It's nasty and dirty. All that air is getting into your house. Mm -hmm. um, and what we actually do, not all, every company does this. Um, maybe you can comment on it if you'd like, but it's what we do is we typically leave three inches on each side of the crawl space open, even when we do install the humidifier. And the reason for that is if you have round gases, got a gas leak, something like that, you're going to get fresh air down. So that, and that's something I've noticed. You never, you never want to get like the 20 mil. I've been to a lot of places where they, where they had an encapsulation done with 20 mil. And what 20 mil is, is two pieces of 10 mil that glued together. And that glue starts to degrade after time by about 10 years. And then you'll start to smell almost like an ammonia, like cat urine basically in the house. Mm -hmm. And so then it's completely encapsulated. So whatever that smell is down there, it's coming right into the house. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's like, yeah, I think I got a dead cat down there. Like, now I've got a vapor barrier. <laughs> it's just starting to break down. So, yeah. Do you have to always replace vapor barriers? Um, we we do a lot of vapor barriers, um, especially originals, you know, 10, 20 years old that are six mil. That's all contractors mm -hmm. can build out. That's done. You get a Home Depot and clear set, roll it out. Typically not staked down, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of done. So is it something you should replace in 10 or 20 years? I would say, so I think the six mil is like every five to six years. But again, I've been in houses that are, you know, 10, 15 years old and the vapor barrier is fine. Uh, and because there's times we'll just install a dehumidifier, like that, that lady's house, she didn't need, need a new vapor. She got a bunch of quotes that included a new vapor barrier. I'm like, you don't need it. You know, it's not tearing apart. It's not crumbly. We just put a dehumidifier down to get dry kind of thing. So. Uh, but typically, you are replacing if, if you're starting to have moisture issues like that. The vapor barriers probably probably shot or wasn't installed right at the beginning. But yeah, that's the difference. Uh, about twenty five hundred bucks to get you a dehumidifier um, installed, and then twenty grand on the high side on the moisture. If you got to go into full insulation um, and kind of and encapsulate kind of a thing on you know twenty five hundred square foot house, you're looking at about twenty grand. Uh, that's that's one of the biggest things I see too. Once you get moisture, that R19 insulation, um, it gets wet and it will not dry out, and that's where you start to get all your fungal growth growing inside that insulation, and you actually have to pull it out because if your subfloor is wet, you put a dehumidifier down there, it's probably not going to dry out. So we got to get all that insulation out um, and then dry it out after that. Uh, we do we do R19 insulation. We we install that. Uh, but we typically like to install the foam board just because that, that R19 insulation, you see a lot of rats, rodents. So, I mean, they're making nests out of it. It holds on just like the worst stuff you can have. I'll say it, I mean, it just holds on to moisture and it's bedding material for rodents more or less. Yeah. Any questions on that? Yeah, it's good stuff. I got it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just curious why do some builders? Uh, well, it's, 
Well, it's it, it's cheaper to do it on flat. Okay, uh, that's I think the biggest reason. Right. Yeah. So what are the pros and cons between like a cross fade or a flat? Well, the cross fade gets you off the ground, right? So right. you got a flood. You know, you're in a flood zone in slab. In fact, they can build slab in flood zone, but I've seen slabs where it's like I, I wouldn't want it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's, uh, you can flood out pretty easy, and then especially with plumbing and electrical. So if, you, if I got to run a core through the house and I got a crawl space, it's pretty easy. Right. I'm on a slab, I'm not going to hold some wall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, I thought you like take it home, home, I saw. And it feels like the How do you fix it? Meaning, like the sub like the flooring, it just depends. You right. know, I've seen it depends on how bad it is. Right. I've seen flooring kind of snap back in place as we grind it up. Okay. Like around like we're gonna have to replace it and just dry it out. Right. Dry it out, it's like walking on new soap. Right. It just depends on how many times it's gotten wet and dried out. It's not gonna do that. You know what I mean? I know I mean I'm sure carpet is cuddling as well. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of the long trip to the long trip, right? Not flat, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of fire from like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we run, run across a lot, but it's like the older homes I got north, of, like the true lumber that were using the good lumber back in the day, but like tanks, yeah, you know what I mean? I mean, they got termite damage, like, so what, uh, <laughs> you know, and that's the other thing about it. out here, we don't have termites that eat dry wood, so it's got to be wet. So again, you get to keep it dry, right? And not getting rot, and not getting fungal growth, and not getting termites. So it's a good thing to do, for sure. Don't eat dry wood. Not here. But there's some that do, and I can't, I can't remember where. I know it's not here. Wow, they will eat dry. Is it California? Yeah, the whole coast. Yeah, I was talking to like somehow. I haven't talked to him in a while, but that. Met a guy that ended up being a home inspector in like San Francisco. He was like, "Yeah, dude, we have polybutylene from 1960s. We have termites, you know, that right. dry wood. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a different, different ball game. And ball. Mm -hmm. um, so, a raised flap is it kind of like a crawl space where it's hollowed out inside of it, or is it like a uh, solid foundation block? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, okay, it's full of fill that they can press down. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. They're built. Are they building more slab now? Would you say? Yeah. Almost slab. Yeah. It's less expensive to build. Right. Well, I mean, you work with buyers. Believe through my experience, most buyers they don't want to buy a place on a small space. Mm -hmm. But they may not be really determined. Right. Right. So figure out if it's a slab. So I'm trying to figure out ways like, hey, all things have to be good because they can bring up and down. Right, right, yeah, but yeah, it's like a whole lot of both of them really there. I think if you go to remodel the home, the call is a cheaper, right? Right, yeah, knocking out half the wall to get what you need to get to, right? Got it, okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah, good, sounds good, yeah, great. Most important part. <laughs> cool. yeah. well, that's all yeah. I got. Unless you got any more questions, you got it. Right. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, as this uh, logo says, we are Virginia Beach Home Inspection. My name is Russell Clark, and this is Caitlin Clark. Wait, we're a husband and wife team. Um, let's see here. I'll give you a little bit of an about us because we're a small company. We're um, it's really just us. We've had apprentices in the past, but really, it's just us. So. Um, I don't like belaboring all of this stuff, but uh, I went to school. I went to school to be an architect. And when I graduated, the economy was in. Oh, that's that, so they can see. The economy was on the rock bottom. So um, I didn't become an architect. I became a home inspector. I've been doing it ever since. Various other things. And various other things. Um, and Caitlin, she worked for you when I told you what you did. Um, I was a construction <laughs> project manager and facility manager for a retailer on the East Coast. So for about 13 years, I was just traveling for construction and then I thought I would not travel as much so facilities but uh that still kept me away um H&M took over a lot of stuff but um I also have done uh, product quality at another company uh with one of these guys <laughs> John and I used to work together at IKEA but um yeah and I'll probably combine them to give the best inspection possible 
we're knowledgeable and have an eye for detail. So and our first house when was built. So haunted bad enough. Um we have a lot of this is just a fraction of all of the different certifications that we have, but we went to school for a long time to learn all of the ins and outs of inspections and uh I don't think we have a reporting certification. So we are we know what we're talking about. He's done um, so many that you can master <laughs> inspector now, which you have to pay extra fees and do a lot of inspections. Um <laughs> essentially what it is. <laughs> all right. So um I asked Helen who's the audience and she said agents. So um you know, uh, agents have some real estate agents have done thousands of home inspections and some have never done one yet. So this is just sort of a general, basic, quick talk about home inspections. So what is a home inspection? Um, if I was real fancy at slideshows, it would be like bullet point, then bullet point, then bullet point mm -hmm. coming up. But sorry, you're going to get them all at one time. So uh, visual only. What does that mean? Visual only means that uh, when we come into a house, we're not going to disassemble anything in the house to get to what we're looking at, right? We can't look into the walls. We're just going to look at the walls. We're going to make assumptions based off of what we see. Is there something happening behind it? Uh, we're not allowed to take anything apart. We're not allowed, allowed to disassemble anything. Now, we do have uh, special tools. We have infrared cameras. We have moisture meters. We have things that will let us peer into the spectrum and look a little bit deeper as to maybe find problems, but we're not allowed to take anything apart. So that's what visual means. You do take the electric panel. Yeah, but that, that's made to come off. We don't want like, to disassemble <laughs> things. We're not cutting it in. Yeah, if it's box closed, we're not going to cut. Yes. All right. Um, standards of practice. What is the standards of practice? So we, uh, there are a couple of different standards of practice. Virginia and your Department of Occupational Professional, whatever it's called, DEPOR. Um, DEPOR gives home inspectors a specific checklist of things that we have to look for. And um, that checklist is pretty small and minimal. So almost every home inspector inspects to a little bit more than minimum at DEPOR. What we do is we get certified by a a society of home inspectors, there's two major ones, and that society teaches us how to inspect at a little bit better level, and that's what we inspect to is that society standards of practice. So, you know, I'm not going to go through each category, but, you know, it's parts of the house. So there's an electrical component, there's a plumbing, there's an HVAC component, there's structure, you know, there's there's each part of the house kind of, we have to inspect a certain amount of criteria of that as laid out. So what we're doing is we're not just going around flashing around and then checking off stuff randomly where you have, we kind of do the same inspection every single time. Can you guys? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we kind of do the same exact inspection on the same exact items every single time. That's why it's standard and that's why it looks like we move really fast around. Um, and then uh, if you've never done a home inspection, at least with us, and this is kind of what I hear from other guys too, is that it takes about an hour per 1,000 square foot house. So if you're bringing us into you know 1,100 square foot condo, it takes an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes to get in, get it done, and get it buttoned up. But if you're bringing us into a 4,000 square foot home, no matter how vacant it is, no matter how clean and easy it is, it's still going to take us almost four hours because of just how big it is. So that's, if you're ever trying to guess or with your home inspector, how long is it going to take to do my home inspection? And if the clients like to shimmer, <laughs> um, maybe have them show up closer to the end so we can run through. And when they get there and they're starting to ask questions, we put the puzzle of the house a little bit more together because um, that does impact how long the inspection takes. And uh, sometimes uh, people can be distracted. Dads. Dad. We are not, uh, dads. We are not dads. When dads show up, the inspection takes long. <laughs> okay, it's not a problem. <laughs> okay, uh, so that, that is, and this is just super basic. So forgive me for how basic this is. And what is an inspection not? I, mean, I can probably put a million more things on here, but inspection is not an appraisal. So, we're not going to talk anything that has to do with the money at all. I don't care how much the house is. I don't care what the neighborhood is. I don't care how much the house is worth. It doesn't matter. It could be a really cheap house in a really nice neighborhood, good deal for you guys, or it could be a really overpriced house in a really crappy neighborhood. I don't care. You know, whatever it matters. I just want to look at the house itself. What's in the house? How it was built and constructed? Is it safe? Is it unsafe? I don't care about how much it is. Um, termite moisture inspection. So this is a gray area because we do the home inspection does overlap termite and moisture. We're looking for termites. We're looking for moisture. But we're not giving you a letter. We're not giving you anything that's going to suffice your mortgage that says the house is free, clean, and clear of termites. The home inspection report might say that, but it's not that same as the letter. Um, and no matter what education we have, we are not giving you architectural or engineering. Um, we're not giving consulting in that. So what does that mean? It means that we're not at, at all going to determine whether something is adequate or inadequate in terms of structure. We're looking for things that are inadequate structure all the time. So it's sort of a knock conundrum. We are looking for inadequate structure. 
but I, we're never going to say this is structurally sound. We're never going to say, um, yeah, that wall is load bearing or it's not load bearing, even though we can determine that that's just not part of the administration. It's one of those few things that we're not going to do. So if the client's like, can I take this wall out? Like, you can take any wall out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can, you can, with enough money and the right engineering behind it, you can remove anything. It's all, it's, it's dual. Russell does recap which way um, the means and the structures are held if it's being asked um, in the general comments. So, <laughs> and, and then and to brief, that is what a home inspection is not. But it's it's not any other type of inspection either. So there's mold inspection, there's lead inspection, there's asbestos inspection. There's we do mold inspection, but uh, we we don't. If somebody's asking for a mold inspection up front. We wait until we're on site to see if there's actual real concerns because um, some people are scared. Um, and most things are just mildew. <laughs> well, uh, but I'm just saying, uh, we if you do have those uh, questions about mold inspections, give us a call. Um, typically, if you're going to try to schedule one, though, Russell's going to try to back it off until we're on site. We'll bring all of the tools for it, but um, it's about the same price as the inspection. What we find is that uh, a lot of people that come from up north, the, the locales up there actually require mold inspections as part of the transaction. So they're just kind of used to it. They're like, it's built into their mindset. And then some people just have severe allergies to mold. So they want, they're like, hey, I need mold test. You know, there's mold everywhere. If I did a mold test in here and it's a nice, clean, beautiful place, I'd find mold. It's but it's probably the same as outside of the gym. So. Exactly. <laughs> That's the mold test always scary. That's commonly the deal because it's, it always comes back positive. What, what happens from then is that we get spoiled. It's a whole rabbit yes. hole. So we try to avoid that rabbit hole from here. Okay. Um, and then basic expectations. This is for clients in general. This is probably super basic. So um, when we when, when you book a, an inspection with us, or if your client books an inspection with us, we're gonna create a confirmation email that's gonna we're gonna create two documents. We're gonna create an invoice that we need money for, and then we're gonna create a legal document, you know, a pre-inspection agreement. Um, our attorney has told us that we are not allowed to uh, begin any inspection at all or any circumstance without a signing. So if the client's offsite, they're gonna have to find that email and get stuff signed remotely. I mean, it's as easy as right. Or if you have an elderly client um, that you have communication with, you can sign on uh, We have a few people that do that. This is very many things goes because we're having to always get to inspections and then we need to get signed. So if we follow up with you beforehand mm -hmm. about the clients um, leading up to the inspections, because we want to start on time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next is pretty pretty obvious. I, all that basic expectation for the inspector is when we arrive, all of the utilities should be on, right? We shouldn't get there and like, oh, hey, the, by the way, the power's off. Well, no, no, you're not gonna... well, no if, if, you know, by the, if the power's off or the water's off and the gas is off, it's going to be a restriction. You can't inspect your gas furnace if there's no gas, and I can't inspect your lights if there's no light, and I can't inspect your water if there's no water. I don't know if something leaks if there's no water. There's, this is the big um restriction and then sometimes it's also a gray area because everybody wants to come back out later and inspect that stuff but we're not going to come out for free we're going to come out for free and then everybody's always strapped you know it becomes a new so an issue so if we can get in front of that uh that'd be good and then uh kind of the second the access to all areas of the inspection that's more or less one in the same too so a lot of times there's a detached garage and that detached garage is locked with some crazy padlock and nobody has the key to it so we can't get inside um and then tenants Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to order pulling the attic down. We need to be able to access that, pulling the electrical panel off. Yeah. Sometimes people put shelves that overlap the panel so you can see inside of it. And we really love to see inside your electrical wire. When like people are packing out of their homes, they have a tendency to pack everything into the garage and you just put it right up against the electric panel. You can't pull the panel off. So you know, kind of fun stuff in the panel. Uh, tenants are always fun, right? Because HBCO, everybody knows about tenants. Um, I'm not going to get into details, but man, I've had some of the most lively stories of all time just involving tenants trying to do a home inspection and there's tenants present. I can write a book. Um, pets, that's another one, you know. I, I mean, we're dog lovers and that, that doesn't matter, but you know, if your dog's going to bite us or something, it's going to interfere. And really, more importantly, it, I don't want to have to worry about any animal in the house escaping when I'm going in and out of the, the house because I'm not really thinking about stuff at that point. I'm inspecting and I'm doing a crazy inspector. Um, Seemingly basic, <laughs> but um, definitely commentable on our side that we run into uh, at least one of these things Every not day. done a few times a week. So, um, yeah. So basic, and then, you know, super basic expectations, but. It, that being said, that we've had agents that we've known for 10 years almost, and they still, you know, oh, the gas is on. 
Communication is key. If you guys ever run into that situation, um, you know the uh, utilities that aren't going to be on, just give us a shout so we can try to rearrange you as quick as possible. Um, or if we have to split it, and if you guys want us to invoice the seller side or something like that, we we have any communication. Yeah, any communication. <laughs> you guys are on the seller side. We always double check that they are on um, at least a week prior to that because if it's not. And the inspector's going to get there, and then we, and then everything's delayed. And if you're on the buyer side, following up with the listing agent saying, Hey, all these buildings are on, right? So there's been a couple times where I've shown them up, and it's like the water's off. And then he's like, Well, I can inspect everything except the water. And then now you got to come back, delay everything again. So, it's or the call <laughs> stays for <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Of course. So, it's exactly. a 150 fee for yeah. the to come out, which is also a re inspect fee. So, if you do on the buying side have a lot to get fixed, uh, we can come out and re inspect that um, right around your walkthrough or something like that. Um, okay. So, um, <laughs> top finds this week. And uh, I like the show off a lot, but because we're just talking about words and concepts, but it's better to see details. Like the slides you yeah. have nothing but photos on them, it's kind of got some deep words. And the way to go. Um, yeah, I didn't tell me when it's nothing to So I used to show, I always, I used to do a lot more of these, and I used to always just show off photos of like crazy things that we've found over the years. And We've done so many now that I can't look back that far. So there's just too many photos to look at. So all I did was look back one week from like <laughs> yesterday in a week. So you're going to see some of my top finds within one week. It ranges from like 250,000 to 2.5 million. So here's some of the, oh yeah, this is when you're done, you know, 200,000 on the low end, like 2.4, 2.5. Yeah, we had like, we yeah. just this week. So it's so electric, right? This is our infrared camera. Um, it shows as opposed to light, like we see with our eyes. So in each of these, uh, you can't see the temperature on the top one, but these things are super hot. They're, they're 150, 170, and 162. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to see that with the naked eye. If you pulled the camera off and just looked at it, you're like, okay, it looks like a bunch of wires, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's, it's paramount to get a home inspection because not, not that we have fancy equipment, but we know what to look for and we know what can go wrong. So we're looking for these things that, you know, everybody can, Everybody has a tendency to look for problems. Like if you see like a, um, this is a brand new place, like, find anything. but you know, there's like cracks in the wall or something, right? So everybody's eye gets trained onto a crack, but nobody's eye gets trained onto something they don't know could be a problem. It doesn't jump out at you, you don't know what it is. So I'm behind the panel looking through an infrared camera, finding defects. These are three that I found this week. I mean, I did 35 of them. So there was- Is that the generator? That's the generator input up there, yeah. So we had some interesting things, you know, these two are entrances. <laughs> Entrance wires coming into the main panel. This one's like a generator. I don't even know why that one had temperature. So the generator wasn't supposed to have any power coming into it. Yeah. And it was coming in. So if they were to use it and put turn the power on, both coming in, it would cause a lot of What did So the great question. Uh, ambient, whatever ambient is for the day. And uh, so right here, ambient is 74, which means the lowest temperature that I'm recording is about 74. It's that number plus 50 is allowable per like the, the electrical guidelines. So, you know, if it's cold outside, if it's like 20 degrees outside, you can't expect the panel to be very hot on the day. Right. So not too much more temperature than if the breaker is like just over overdoing it with power. There's too much resistivity inside the breaker. Yeah. But also if this is air and the coming outside, these temperatures look right. So right. 50 over ambient. Everything's hot. Exactly. So 50 over ambient. In this case, there these are like from 100 over the lowest, maybe 80 over is the lowest one. So they're unseen except for with specialized equipment. And that's why I like to show them because you know, these ex cameras are expensive. And I like to show those. <laughs> they they do their job. They're worth their weight in gold. Um, plumbing, right? So you hit it right on the head. Water is literally the, the downfall of all homes. We worry about electric, right? We worry about that because that can catch on fire. The fire is catastrophic. I lost an uncle in a house. Mm -hmm. So everything gets destroyed by water, either liquid water, water vapor, even an ice. You know. So here's just a couple things, and these are these are random, but these are four different things that I found. So this is a <laughs> comically wrong trap in a in a phone right? But just that's so funny. Like, good God, it's an S trap. Anytime the trap goes down enough and then straight back down, it's already wrong. And then it has this crazy like yeah. flexoid plumbing, like a kid's little down. 
Uh, incorrect installation. We know it's like a football game is on. Football's coming on at 1 30. It's 12 o'clock. You get it done. You know, like, oh, I'm going to have a trap done. I'm going to watch this game. It's good. They did stuff like this where the film owner was there and then plumbing was there. So I don't. Yeah. Oh, so, so, like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you're leaving this. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one kind of marks it's just a cast iron plumbing. Um, cast iron plumbing, you will find it in most homes. I've, I've seen it in homes built in the 90s, so it's it's a uh, I call it antiquated kind of right? It's it's iron, it looks like that, it almost looks like that from the outside, but it fails from the inside, so it slowly grows rust tentacles literally, like these rusticles, and it gets clogged on the inside and it ruptures or it clogs and backs up into your, your bathtub. Um, but we're on the second floor, we're in. Yeah. but we don't know what's really happening ever, right? So a home inspection can't reveal everything. This is part of that visual only. So the the, the course of action is whenever you're buying a house, any house that has cast iron plumbing, the home inspector is like, hey, the cast iron plumbing. Have a, a plumber with a bore scope or a long scope that can scope the entire plumbing system from the inside out. And they'll tell you what's going on, what's its condition, is it, you know, is it going to last long, is any repairs going to get made, and so on and so forth. Good. Well, if you remember, we had one of these at one of my houses, mm -hmm. and um, we had a plumber come out and they laid a camera through it. Was it RPG? And you were in the movie. It was not <laughs> They had like a 20,000 more camera? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, the next problem was she had to come out and inspect it. Now, obviously, people freak out because it's all piping and stuff, but it turns out it's really fine. So yeah, so it's always false. Yeah. yeah, just because you see it doesn't mean that it's going to be dead enough to help or anything. But yes, he will tell you what you need and then we'll reset it. Or it's like my contract, probably if I would go to the 90s, the original, I'd have to spend about 14 and it's usually zero. So if our house is still in the 90s, it's called. Yeah, same thing. There's two, three generations of calls. So, right. Just like with the electrical stuff, I had a couple of those. It's funny, I have an electrician too that I work with pretty closely, so I've done a picture. And one of them, he was like, hey, it's great if you go this high, it's fine. And yeah. then another one, he was like, no, we need to get out there and do this and stuff. So obviously, the person said every house will change. Yeah. Too. Just because you see the same stuff on multiple inspections doesn't mean it's detrimental in every house. It could be, you know, fine one house and down in another. Absolutely. And that's where we have to be generalists and punt it over mm -hmm. to this session. Okay, exactly. That's why we're, we can identify the defect, but we we're never going to tell you how to fix it. always going to tell you who you want to take all right, all right. all right. So, uh, top right bumper just has a little bit of um, which direction does water flow down? down. down. That's right, it always flows down, right? So, if you ever see plumbing where it's flowing up, that's always a problem. Right? It might not be a problem the day of the inspection, it might not have backed up or anything, but it's gonna be a problem because it's gonna slowly accumulate junk and then it's slowly gonna slowly. Make the entire inside of the pipe get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get a full flow. Um, I would say 75% of all plumbing that I inspect has one, at least one pipe that is back right in the seat. So, and some of it can just get retightened and stuff like that, but at the inspection, if it's not level, we're going to yeah, call it that. Absolutely. Uh, and then that bottom right photo is super small, but it's of a water here. Um, and it's kind of at, I believe it's at the very bottom where that's kind of like where you go to drain it out from. But you see a bunch of oxidation there. And the water heater wasn't old. It was a water heater. Like we just look at the data, like, oh, the water heater is six years old. But good. The water heater was rusted all the way through everywhere. So, you know, we wrote that water up as being excessively corroded and needs to be replaced, even though it's six years old. So um, sometimes, you know, it's easy. You do real estate long enough, you learn how to almost read the labels off of anything already. And you're like, oh, this HVAC is this, 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 this age. But sometimes you can't just go out on that age. Sometimes it's, you got to inspect the actual unit. So that's why having a home inspector is good because we're going to look at not just the age, but you know, every part of them, every system. So in this case, an oxidized water heater we should always get replaced. We, we inspected a brand new water heater with one little pinhole of oxidation. It looked like something drops off on it, it rusted. And we did, it was for a pediatric nervous surgeon. They bought the house and then the thing had blown up. Like the day they bought the house, it was like blown up in their face. That's like the worst. I always would think about it. I mean, these people flew in to live here to do the specialized job. And he, <laughs> the owner, laughing about it yeah. because we can talk about it. Yeah. And, wow, man. So, I'm glad right? some people have yeah. that kind of take on it. Yeah. So I always, we inspect everything. That's this is part of really this talk of the, these are all these photos are the reasons why you should always have a home. 
I mean, these are obviously common things, but um, there's just always stuff that we're going to find. So HVAC, uh, what does HVAC stand for? That's right. Um, the ventilation is the part everybody forgets about. So ventilation, that's a dryer vent in the top left, right? I can't think of a more flammable thing in a home than dryer. Uh, we teach, we use the lead scouts and we teach boys basically how to make fire with that's the dryer thing. vents, like it's the most flammable thing. Um, it, it really is. It, just as flammable as natural gas, if they could pump dryer vents through those pipes, you'd be, we'd be come off and you go on naked and spray it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm naked. Like, I turned my home to the vent. If you're hiring someone to paint your dryer vent, um, if it's a straight out one, it's about $70. If it goes up and out, it's about 110 um, we first used high water chimney. They have fire fighters, but um, that was recently. Uh, ours went up and out because it's 109. They did it fast, and it was scary because there was a lot. How often should someone do that? We recommend once a year. Yeah, I've been in my house four years. I guess maybe. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I think ours have been in dryer forever. Once um, we had gotten a used dryer from my mom, and we had company in town, and something in the dryer caught on fire. So. You know, he walked around the house for an hour looking for like, oh, like something's on fire in this house. He came back to sleep, but like there's nothing on fire in the house. And he finally was like, my God, the dryer itself is on fire from the inside of the dryer. Oh my God. Like, what am I listening to? I close to them. So anytime something happens, I call them. So I better clean my phone. We're like, I'm scared of my We're like, I'm scared of my because it was done badly, and when they rerouted it, they took pictures of the old one, and you could see all the water was already black from burning around and getting so hot. And it's like, well, good thing we did this now. Yeah. Because they didn't Our lid was charred on the inside yeah. of it. It was scary. On the one, yeah. on our current. Yeah. And it yeah. Had, our non fire. We don't know how long it had That's been. Scary. We had been there for two years before we did it. So it was definitely worth it. I feel really good. I usually turn the dryer off. In fact, um, there's there's so many defects in that home inspection that I leave checked them out. So dryer lint, I did just you, if I do inspection for you, just assume I'm going to say you have dryer lint that needs to get cleaned out because of the fire. I don't even look for it anymore. I mean, I take pictures because it's a good picture, but I don't. It just comes built into the report now. You, you automatically have it. Maybe a new home inspection, I think. But other than that, you get it. Um, bottom photo, obviously, is pretty pretty self-explanatory. That is the worst looking duct I've seen in a while. It's just, uh, just uh, chupacabra got in there. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it could be contractors rolling through it. It could be rodent. It could be, that was just a nasty crawl face all the way around. The bottom right photo is a, of a sagging vent. So that is a dryer vent, and it is not allowed to be flexible in the crawl space. So, I mean, I'm not going to like go over every little defect is fine at all, but a flexible dryer vent is might as well just be full of lint. It's going to fill up with yeah. lint at the bottom. It's going to slowly accumulate moisture at the bottom. And if you go to clean it, you're going to rip. You're going to just like rip the whole thing out. So it's required. There's bicolors specifically. This metal vent basically is what's required to go all the way, all the way to it. Um, and then this last one is like a data plate. And um, I always try to include that for HVAC because R22 is the type of refrigerant that is a lot of people still have this, the old obsolete refrigerator. In 2010, well, let me back that up. In the 1990s, we used to hear on the news a lot about where there's holes in the frozen layer, right? Yeah, everybody remember that, there's holes in the frozen layer. And then they banned all these chlorofluorocarbons like Aquanet hairspray and <laughs> a lot of refrigerant that we used to use in our systems. Uh, and because government's really slow, it took until 20, 2010 for them to actually like have legislation put in where nobody's now allowed to put R22 and systems and stuff like that. So it took like 30 years for that to happen. But since 2010, we have a new refrigerant. And as a result, the old stuff is becoming very expensive. They don't make it anymore. The government doesn't allow it to be made anymore. You can still have it. You can still like have it put into your system, but you're paying like three, to sometimes four times the amount of money that you would pay for the new stuff. So it's like gas that, you, that doesn't get used like a car gets used, but it still gets, it still leaks out. So you don't want to pay for something that's very expensive that there's a finite commodity there. And then there's one guy in America that bought it. So, uh, but, no, no, but, no, but there's a there's a guy that has like an entire barn garden security force holding guarding the warehouse full of this stuff. So it's gonna go up. It's gonna become thousands of dollars. Wow! It's so already three hundred. R twenty two aged out uh, four ten alpha is what we're hoping. Is. Yep. Exactly. 
So uh, this part of the home inspection, we're gonna confirm or verify the age of everything, right? If you're like read a listing and the listing's like new roof, new HVAC, new water heater, then like the home inspector's like, yeah, this water heater's from like 1754, this room is, you know, everything is very old, you know, and you're like, but the listing says this. So part of the home inspection is we're gonna really come in and verify. Now I can't tell you if the roof is brand new or five years old, but I can certainly tell you if the roof is new or old, right? And I can tell you, does it need to get replaced or is it, yeah, it falls within that time range. HVAC, there's a date stamp on it. I can tell you that that one was made in said, August of 2003. So you know, when I was leaving for college. It was being installed right here. Um, let's see here. Uh, microbial roof. And I put that in quotation marks because um, legally speaking, we can't tell you that that is anything more than microbial, right? Even though we know it's mold, <laughs> it's crazy stuff. Um, Whenever we see stuff growing, we have to put it on the report as microbial. Now, this these would be great candidates to have on old dust because holy moly, that is a lot of them. Yeah, and I don't want to say this came up. So yeah, things can grow. Uh, things these are you know I don't want to speculate as what that is, but it looks a lot like microbial. And um, that's the can you kill me? And once you're starting to see it, you <laughs> might not need a mold test. You might just need to start your the fancy rule of the fancy black and white is if there's nine square feet of mold or more you have to have it abated already they have to like set up a negative pressure system suck out the air and wow. take all the stuff out if it's smaller than that uh not even this, this again this isn't like a mold in a house yeah that's why i had a contractor look at some and he said that it was like just it had turned from once it was dry. Does that mean I don't have to worry about it? Likely, yes. So if it's if it's wet, it's alive, it's doing something. Um, and really what needs to happen is the moisture source itself needs to be investigated. Like why is why is something wet somewhere near this? If it's dry, what needs to be investigated is was something once wet that's now fixed, or is this like a once in a lifetime moisture event? Or you know, like what was why was it wet to begin with? Where's the root problem? Yep. So, so if the root problem, if it's guaranteed to be dry, like if you can see that it's dry, it's clearly not, then likely stain blocking. I would still clean the wall, like soap water, clean it. Stain blocking primer should work because it's, even though you're not getting rid of anything, it's not alive. And if that moisture source never comes back, then in theory, it can never grow. Um, we, we did a whole test just last week of like a stain from a, a roof leak. It was somebody that just moved into their rental house. Went into the attic, brand new insulation. So the roof looked new. The only thing we could come up with was it was probably fixed. The mold sample came back wrong. So, um, yeah. So you could even, if this was dry, you could even send a sample off that of known true. mold, or known something that was grown in the lab and say it's accumulated spores, but it's okay. It's, it's, okay. it's not a liar. So, Can you tell if it's mildew or a lab? That's why, I, that's why I literally. Okay. Microbial growth, right? Because we can tell that this is something microscopic growing. I can't tell you if it's mold, algae, mildew, fungi, bacteria. There's a lot of crazy little stuff. Monday through Thursday, if we get mold tests done before like two o'clock, we can get it out and have the results within 24 to 48 hours by the end of like the next business. If you're ever having somebody that's super worried about it. All right, so this initially said crawl space, and then I realized that the crawl space is coming. I made a foundation for crawl space in the last minute. I was like, all right, let me change this. All right, so um, you guys, we've already kind of talked about the foundation of the crawl space, right? There's two main types of foundation there's slabs and um, slabs and crawl spaces. So uh, I think every one of these, well, there's one. Slab. So in a crawl space, I save it for last in the home inspection. So, like, if I'm if I'm doing a house, the crawl space is the very last thing that I do because it's the first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then when I get done, but I'm out, when I get out of the crawl space, all I need to get out. You know, like everyone get out of dodge at that point. So, um, I save some photos. These are all literally these are all from this week, uh, and there's some fun stuff. So, just in short, top left photo. Uh, this is super common. Um, Plumbers tend to not care about anything, so they will cut through anything to put their plumbing stuff in. So they, they're like, <laughs> they're like, we're going to cut through that poor joist up there just to get this one drain in. They couldn't have moved it four inches. They couldn't, have, you know, so cut right on through it. One to the right. Um, that's some pretty, some pretty significant fungi. I would say that 
fun fungi we're destroying. You can kind of even see the actual. Now this is dry. Yeah, you, can right? you can even see like the actual material of the fungus still so kind of hanging there. Although it's, it's gross. The next one over is sort of a that one's like the melting pot because there's on the joist that you can see in the foreground with the wood destroying fungi and then that green stuff on the subfloor. Um, Microbilbert. <laughs> it, it would take a lab to really figure out. You know, it's 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 likely some moldy from moisture that's on that subfloor by the bathroom. And all that uh, bottom right photo, bottom left photo. Let me say that. Let me get it right. L left. Bottom left. Uh, that little kind of like sawdusty looking thing traveling up right there. That is called a shelter tube, one of the remnants of the shelter tube, and that is how termites like to travel. So I'm glad you said it earlier too. You know, we, termites in, in our area they eat wet wood. So they're subterranean and they really they can't uh they can't exist out in the open. Like a term you ever really just see termites hanging out anywhere? You don't like you only see them inside of wood because they're so delicate the air and the temperature they just can't live. So termites are always trying to get to hot, moist, wet wood. That's their favorite thing to be in, is just that's where they, they want to live where they eat. So because most of our homes have some form of, you know, this is a slab, this is a CMU block right here, and this stuff, they can't eat that stuff. So what they do is they build, they regurgitate what they eat into yeah. these like hollow straws, and they crawl through the straws until they find it, until they get their way to wood again. So they're called shelter tubes. And um, that's the way that termite inspectors, that's the way we, the home inspectors, is how we look for termites or evidence of termites, right? Because without this, you don't see anything. Like, I'm you know, a little bit right there. There's nothing to see. So there's no damage in that in that seal plate. So we have to look for evidence because termites, they decided to keep going in, into the wall and elsewhere because there was better wood elsewhere. Um, so we look at termites. Uh, middle, bottom one, that's a classic moisture in the crawl space photo. Um, you know, a lot of people say it's from the ductwork. That's not the case. What's happening is the crawl space air is just insanely wet. Relative humidity is insanely high. And then because they're running AC through that ductwork, the AC is causing all of that moisture locally to just condensate and drip off. So it looks like a rainforest. Um, and, and you said it right too. You know, air, hot, humid air comes into the crawl space in the summertime. Air has a tendency to stratify. So that's sort of a fancy word for hot air is going to rise, cold air is going to fall. And as the hot air rises, it doesn't take the moisture with it. It leaves the moisture in the crawl space. So you're getting perpetual crawl space air, but it's leaving the moisture in the crawl space. So eventually, there's more, way more moisture in the crawl space than even that's in the relative humidity of the air outside. So the crawl space becomes like the check valve chronic lung problem of of moisture so that's why we see these types of things mm -hmm. um and then on the bottom right that is uh i guess i should put in quotation it's asbestos like material um you know we still have old homes in this area this home wasn't even that old it was like 65. uh that, that, i think that was in the 2.5 million but um asbestos in that condition is not necessarily a problem but the second you touch it it fries up into the air and if you breathe it in you can expose yourself to some contaminants uh, so we write up all of our asbestos whenever we see it. Uh, the guy that was buying this house was from California, hyper worried about it, a little bit more worried about general things. So he was petrified of this asbestos. So, you know, I told him he needs to have it all removed and abated, but there's still asbestos in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's good to know, it's good to look for it. You can buy a house um, where all the asbestos is no longer on the pipes, but it's all on the ground. And you're crawling around on it, not knowing that you're crawling on asbestos material. So if you're not wearing, wow, I, I, I didn't, I have a bunch of photos of me in like my call space suit, right? And, and, you know, like, but was, I was going to just show how many times I go in the call space, but um, you basically have to wear like a full face respirator around asbestos to not be affected by it, like a P100 filter on top of it. So just the person that by N95 mask or anything like that, you're still breathing in it's not protecting you from, from the asbestos. So if you have a contract where you get to ask for stuff on your PDRA and things are being removed or stuff like that, um, especially with asbestos, that'd be a good time to ask for a reinspection for a You don't want that afterwards because you have to have a somebody with a license has to be able to do that. Do you, do you work with the company? Because I get asked all the time. We don't make sure. I know I have two companies, but I don't want to see it like is insanely expensive, like they're gonna invest the brain to lose. And they go to a school, you know, like real big, and then I know that they go to the like, truck. So, like, a really small, like, something like that would be, uh, they're right. licensed, right? Yeah, and you can help with content and you get it. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. so just foundation and cross-based, and 
Thank you. Um, one more thing on the microbial growth. Um, I would say so a lot of things that you see though is like your supply rooms, like in the bathrooms or in the, the registers getting dirty. One thing you can do, you can just pop those off, clean them around it, dust it first, don't wipe it with a cloth because it will smear the dust. But then um, put them back up and just watch to see if it was just bad maintenance of the filters not being changed in the home, or if it's in an area that just has a lot of wind flow, like bathrooms with kids, um, they make it so humid that sometimes there's growth in some of the areas. So if you have semi-gloss paint in the bathrooms and it's all always uh, getting wet in condensation, you'll start seeing little mildew spots. So that's really just kind of a maintenance thing. Have your homeowner get in there and wipe it down and watch it. Probably not permeated through um, anywhere, but um, yeah. So some things are not necessarily mm -hmm. need to be tested. You can just go in and check it. I um, swabbed the inside of a filter that hadn't been changed in forever. The same house that had no mold last week, and it was normal as everywhere else, even though they hadn't been changing it for two years. But the filters are gonna when dust starts getting out through the supplies, it just shows. So then it makes everybody work. Cleanliness makes people feel. Dust is all the good things that good one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Did anybody have any questions for the home section side of this? Maybe you want to ask. I am talking with East Coast Mortgage. Most of you know I'm an agent, but before I became an agent, I have 20 years mortgage experience. Um, so customer service is very, very important to me. Um, I am excited about East Coast Mortgage because I always worked for lenders and we only had to use our programs. Well, with East Coast, because we are a broker, we have a multitude of programs that we can choose between and we also have control of pricing. So that helps us. Um, and I like that. <laughs> Actually, I should have went there first. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so right now, everybody knows the market. Um, listings are starting to set a little bit longer. So if you have a listing that is setting and people are concerned about the rate, we have a two one buy down. Um, it can be paid by seller's concessions. So it might be something that you want to offer to get your listing to move. Um, on this particular one, their first rate would be 5.25. So it buys it down for the first two years. They would save $415.91 per month. The second year would be six and a quarter. They would save two hundred twelve dollars and sixty six cents a month. Sixty six cents a month, um, and it costs one point eight eight six. So if you have a listing you not you maybe instead of offering to pay closing costs, you offer to buy down the rate for them. What would year three be? Seven and a quarter. Seven. Oh, so what it is now? Yes. So it's five and the first two year it kind of gives them a chance to get in. They used to paying the payment. You know, hopefully get increases in their income so that they can afford it. Makes them feel more comfortable. So, but three years now, their grades went down and still a quarter of the answer they want. Got it. I got a question. Yeah. If there's a, what kind of loan is this? I mean, like, is this good for like people who want to split houses and stuff like that too? Buy down interest rates for a couple of years or whatever? No, it's typically going to be for a purchase. Okay. For an owner occupied purchase. Oh, well, it's conventional. Um, you can do it conventional or government. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so it's very helpful. We used to do them a lot with Dorothy. You know, 2007, um, we used to do them a whole lot. And back then, they would allow you to qualify at that start rate. Now, you do not qualify at that start rate, but it still makes them feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, short-term rentals are all the rage. So we're about to get into that with Austin. We offer a couple of programs that would be very, very helpful for those. We have a bank statement program. The FICO is 640. It's a max of... LTV of 85%, and you have to have six months of reserves. It's for self employed buyers only. Six months reserves if it's for a primary loan. If it's for an investment, it's 12 months reserves. But basically, you don't have to have tax refunds. You just have 12 months made statements to show your own fund. And you're going to get 15% on that? That is correct. What about like buying a second home? You can do a second home. A second home is still going to be 12 months reserves to buy an investment property. Okay. okay. And then we have the DSCR, 645 on that, 85% LTV, self-employed only for that one. Um, that is eligible for investment properties too. The rent to mortgage has to be 80%. So you're going to take your rent that you would rent the house for, 
you're going to divide that into your mortgage and it has to be at least 80%. Mm -hmm. So a $2,000 mortgage payment, you're going to be running at least $1,600 a month. Mm -hmm. And then there's no income to qualify. You're qualifying based off that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you have to have two months consecutive bank statements and you do have to have six months in reserves. Okay. Both of these programs are not available in West Virginia or Texas. When you say reserves, so if it was 2000 a month, it's just 12 grand. Yeah, have 12 grand. Okay. Yep. That for down there or just reserve for an emergency? Yep, reserve for an emergency. Yeah. They just want to see that if something happens, you pay that payment for about six months. Okay, so whatever the mortgage payment is, time. Um, I I'm sorry, is that the program that for short term rentals or they're for any? No, no, no. So that one um, is eligible for investment property, rate and term, refis, or cash out refinances. Um, that's for an investor. That's the investment properties. But the bank statement you can do on primary residence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that's how I bought my home. It's like it's a higher interest rate. So okay. like since these are specialty loans, it is going to be a little higher interest rate than normal. But I mean, someone like me who tries to write everything off, I couldn't get approved normally. So a bank saving program is how I would get approved uh, because as a business owner, I don't want to pay a ton of taxes. Yeah, sure. But I'll take the hit on the interest rate so I can buy what I want. And it's good for cash out refinance. So he can take one of the current investments that he has to a cash out refinance, get the money to buy his next property. So, okay, so the last one, and I know we're running out of time, is the Genoa program. So that one is 100% financing, um, 600 FICO. The rate is higher than the HGA, okay? But it, you don't have to be a first time home buyer, and there are no income limits. So, the rate is a bit higher. Is that significantly higher interest rate for that one? That seems like yes. It. Yeah, okay. okay. It's probably going to be about a point higher um, or close to a point higher, but you don't have to be a first time home buyer. There's no But these aren't products you're going to use all the time. But it's so bear with me on my voice today. The one time of year this happens on the day I got to talk. <clears throat> so short-term rentals, a little about me. Um, I own four of them right now. They're all around in Snowshoe, West Virginia. Um, this year alone, it'll probably generate a minimum 150K profit. Uh, I would guess somewhere around 175 this year. Um, but because of my real estate mortgage title and insurance background, I know a little bit when it comes to real estate, and I just apply those same strategies to short-term rentals because it's all really the same game. Um, so right now, the four, they're all in, like I said, it's worth about 1.7 million in real estate right now. Um, I've been doing it for about two and a half years. So I just keep adding one every single year. Um, and this map right here shows where all four of them are. Uh, so whenever I've got someone who is renting at one of my places, I'll let them know about the others as well. So I can try and get repeat customers. Um, this is my website of what it looks like. This is something I created. Um, <clears throat> you guys can always have someone create a personal website for you. Uh, I'll go into it in a second, but I use a system called IGMS to where they actually make a website for you. doesn't look as nice, but I wanted something to where people can book directly from me because it saves me fees and it saves them fees. Uh, so I just try to make a cool website. Um, this right here shows my projections. Uh, this is IGMS. And this shows right here in the green what I've been paid out so far and then what's to come. And so you'll see for October right now, it's 12,966. Back in September, it was 18 grand. Um, my all expenses between the four is about 10 grand a month. So when I'm looking at 10 grand and I see 18, I'm like, great, I profited eight grand. Well, now we look at so far booked for December, it's 38,000. For January, it's 52,000. And February, it's 35. Now, I just want to note this is as of today. Last year, when I had the three, I brought in 55,000 from December alone. So, with the fourth one, it should be roughly 75 to 80. And then for January, it should be somewhere between 80 and 90. 
um, which will be wild because saying I'm bringing in 90k from this stuff in one month is retarded. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nuts. Like yeah. like, <clears throat> and because it's a ski resort, between December 20th and January 2nd is where a majority of that is made. So it's like in one weekend, I'll make twenty five thousand. I'm like, this is this is the right. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. And you're spending it the most too. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and so my girlfriend's birthday is December twenty eighth, and she's like, let's go skiing for my birthday. I was like, we're never going skiing. For I know that's <laughs> never, never, ever. Like we are not ever touching. Yeah, exactly. Look so far wrong. Never skiing. <laughs> so um, between the winters, so far booked. It's 129,000. And that's just so far booked. I, I would literally project the winner to bring in about 200,000. Um, most people book out about 30 days in advance and all the weekends get booked first. So if someone's trying to book, even on my website, I'm like, look, book three months in advance because good luck on trying to get in January, February, March. It's 99% booked. Um, so I, I'm going to be quick because I actually got to show house. Um, there's really three stages of a short-term rental. Really, you're prospecting, you're under contract, and managing. And all of them are important to know. Um, when you're prospecting, the very first thing you want to know is where do I want to look? And for me, it's where do I like going? Where do I like vacationing? Because you're going to use this as a place to vacation yourself, um, and others are going to do the same. Now, AirDNA is a website where it's free. It gives you limited data on like rental income, places that are popular, um, but you would have to pay for the version that gives you all the stuff. For me, it comes down to location. Where do I want to be? And when you find that place, you want to get a realtor who knows the area because they'll be able to tell you, yes, it's a hotspot. No, it's not a hotspot. If you're a realtor, you need a referral fee off of it as well. Um, now, this is what I always look for. I look for a place that is has great bones but the most hideous to core and and i say this because like it, you'll see in listings where the photos look horrible or like in snowshoe you have a place where they're decked out in deer stuff or like bears you, you have bears everywhere and it's like dude i don't want to sleep on this bed I this <laughs> deer in bed everywhere or like my last cabin i bought it was christmas Eve. it was year-round <laughs> christmas and so it, it was the worst decor ever, which made it, people didn't want to buy it. And so I get in, I get a good deal. And then I literally throw everything out. So I it, look for a place, good homes, like it's got granite or like soft closed cabinets, something like that, um, like good carpet or like carpet that can be cleaned up. But if it's got like ugly paint, like red paint, perfect. That's what I want. No one wants it. I can easily paint the place. I paint all my places. Um, now, what you're also going to want to do is you're going to want to run comps on this place as well. So just like in real estate, you're going to run comps on like what you're going to sell for. But in this case, what can I rent it out for? And you're going to want to do that for the whole year. And so this takes time. It, it, you're going to look at other Airbnbs, others on VRBO. And then what I want you to do is take 60% of that and say, all right, we're at a 60% ratio, uh, rented ratio. This is how much it's going to bring in. Well, then what I want to do is also estimate the expenses and estimate on the high side, because if I'm at 60% rented and I've got high expenses and there's still a 20K profit, all I'm sold. I, I want it all day because I know I'll get more on the rented side and I know the expenses won't be as high, but I prep for the worst. Um, so then I'm not going into a place where I'm going to take a loss. Now, the next thing is the under contract stage. And... Don't worry, I'll, I'll send everyone this PowerPoint too. But um, this is important because once you're under contract in place, this is actually where you get started. Um, so now what I want to do is, even though I don't own it yet, I want to list it on Airbnb, VRBO, and Booking.com all at the same time. Once I do that, then I'm going to integrate all three of them on a system called IGMS. And IGMS is the software where I can manage it, um, all three in the same place. And then what I want to do is prep mentally what I'm going to need to bring and fix to the place on the day I close. Now, what you do is since we are going to um, put it on the, uh, the three, we want to start receiving bookings, but not for the time where I don't own it and not for the time where I'm going to plan to fix things. So like if I know it's going to take me two weeks after I uh, close on it, 
I'm going to make sure all those times are booked, um, blocked off so no one can get it while I'm working. But I want it to where once I close, I've already got bookings. So when I do finish, someone's checking in the next day. And then that way you've got instant money coming in. Now, you do also have to prepare an inventory checklist uh, because you've got to know what you have to bring there. And with Airbnb, everyone wants it super convenient. Everyone wants everything fully stocked. So you got to make sure it's like, hey, there's glass bowls, silverware, cups, everything. Um, I've got a huge checklist that I go through every single time. And I go through that checklist twice a year because I always got to make sure things are there because people do take things, uh, believe it or not. Um, and then uh, on closing day. So you want to prep to be there on the closing day so you can get started immediately. So wherever it is, you actually want to physically be there. And even in Snowshoe, they're like, yeah, people close remotely all the time. I'm like, no, I'm going to be there so I can actually work on it while I'm there. Um, now, when you're managing it, what you have to do every time, professional photos, and I, I can't stress it enough because you'll go in an Airbnb and you'll see a photo of this, like only this, like a photo of that. I'm like, why are you showcasing this? This, this means nothing. You, you wanna take your best photo first and drive people there. And you also wanna do a video walkthrough because people ask me so many times, Hey, what's inside the place? Like if I can just direct them a YouTube link, I have so many photos because they physically saw it because sometimes photos do hide things and people have been, um, uh, they, they've been screwed way too many times for photos made it look like something, but it's not. So a video, it won't, uh, you're always going to want to showcase your stuff on social media because the more you do it, uh, the more trust it builds into people. Um, you're, and at this point, while you're getting it managed as well, you want to get your cleaner and your handyman set up. Uh, and you want to make sure that your cleaner is going to be good with IGMX. And when I say this, they just have to be good with email. If they're good with email, <laughs> you'll be shocked some people aren't. But if they're good with email, they'll be set up on uh, IGMS. Um, and then within IGMS, you're going to set up templates. Uh, and what I mean by that is when I was first looking at the short-term mental game, I was scared I was going to have to message these people all the time. Well, IGMS will send out auto templates, auto emails to your guests. So all you do is set uh, check-in instructions, check-out instructions, and it auto goes in. So I don't even talk to my guests anymore, but all my reviews say Austin's communication is amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, my auto is sent to like touch them seven times, but I don't ever talk to these guys. It's, it's incredible. Um, now, people do ask wild questions sometimes. So responding to them is key. Um, and I spend about five minutes a week on this, but responding to them gives you a good high rate on your uh, the platforms, but also it just makes them feel good. And you get five stars out of it. Next, you always want to ask for five stars um, because the more reviews you have, especially five stars on every algorithm, you'll actually show up higher compared to everyone else. Um, but then also people want to book yours because they know it's got great reviews. Um, you're going to want to make sure you've got a restocking plan. Uh, in the beginning, I was restocking everything myself and it took a lot of time. So I worked out a deal with my cleaner where I pay her extra and she restocks. And then I charge that extra fee to the renters. So now I'm not even restocking. I'm not even paying for it. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> um, you do actively want to check your properties because I have a high standard for what I do. And I have a high standard for my properties. Well, when I'm walking by and see my cleaners don't realize that this outlet is working, I want to make sure this outlet is working. So I'm going by, checking everything, making sure everything looks good. Um, but it's it's your attention to detail. It's almost like you're going through a home inspection place. You want to make it look good and actively seeing it. So that's why it's like you want to physically go to this place and it's like a vacation at the same time. It's always fun. Um, you got to set up a plan for paying your cleaners. Um, every cleaner is different. Some of them, some of them try to avoid taxes, which uh, it's, it's up to you if you want to do this or not. But I get a W-9 from them. Uh, so then that way that income isn't being counted towards me. Um, so it, even if you're doing it like cash app or PayPal, governments can find it at some point. I do mine through uh, Venmo, but even on there, it's it's still being tracked by the government. So uh, tracking expenses and income, I set up a spreadsheet to be able to track all this because all of this is able to write off. And this is huge when it comes to write-offs for uh, real estate because you can depreciate your assets and for stuff that you bought. So like I did a remodel on cabinets 
and we were able to write off all the cabinets that we put on. Uh, so it's, it's very fun, but your accountant is definitely going to want that info. Um, and then I say strive for better. Um, we are actually prepping to remodel one of them that I got three years ago. And it's like, I don't want to just let it be, forget it and set it. Like you, you always want to make it better because the more people you can have there, the more you can rent it out for, um, and the more you can up the price. So it, it's always making sure that the place is in good order, um, presentable, and again, like just beautiful. So like we're, we're going to do some painting. We're going to add some uh, murals to, to one of them, uh, which is going to be fun. And I knew I flew by that, but any questions? I did that. Is that a certain day's uh, platform? So they, they changed the platform just a little bit. Um, I pay yearly now, and it's yearly two hundred forty dollars. No, no, it used to, right? Well, per property, and so it used to be one dollar per day per book day, which was great because you know if you had twenty bookings for twenty days worth, it was twenty bucks. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found is I was having way more than two hundred forty dollars per. So I, I just pay the yearly amount now. Imagine having proper accounts right here before you found it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Uh, so I did, and then I took the, um, what do you call it, like the previews of every single one, right. and I, I saw IG did everything that I wanted it to. It. Yeah, and it's very affordable too, so, yeah. And, uh, okay. Go ahead, Joy. Go ahead. What, what is your class on you for your... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get into that. So um, I, I'm creating a class right now that dives so deep into the short-term rental game. It'll show everything from like lock boxes to why I did this to here's a real example to this is how you should set your templates. Um, I'm almost done videotaping. Uh, I finished the back half. So I actually showed how to put it on Airbnb, how to put it on VRBM, how to integrate it with IGMS, how to set your settings this way and, and doing that type of stuff. So it'll be ready soon, but I did set up where I will consult for that as well for 500 an hour. But I can tell you that five hundred bucks, you you'll have everything for the rest of your life. So, did you have to do safety inspections for the West Virginia ones? To get no, West to West Virginia is a wild place, man. <laughs> you you don't need to need to get permits. Wow, they're strict down here. They're strict down here, so you, you definitely got to do your research on the area. Virginia Beach is way more crazy. In Snowshoe, West Virginia, no, man, you don't even need a license and contract. It's it's horrible. Oh, yeah. it's, it's it's so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's so bad. John. So I don't know because usually you want to get a book of have in multiple areas, but I've read that it's a lot harder to get into the new market and set all the systems. It is. How you continue to stay just in Snowshoe? Well, my next one is not going to be in Snowshoe, and and I say this because even though the winters are amazing. The summer, fall, and spring is on the lower side. So my next one is going to be in an area where it's high in the summer because what I want to do is create a constant high, not have a low, mediocre, to super high. If I can always create a super high, then I can just literally walk away and chill and just run these. Yeah. So it it is hard to set the systems for like other places, but all you need is a good handyman and a good cleaner in that area, and you can replicate the system anywhere. And that, that's it. Yeah. And honestly, the, the cleaner is like, as long as they're reliable, that's all that matters. So if, if they're always like IGMS is great because it notifies them when they're going to clean and then it notifies them the day before and the day of. The clean. So like they have no excuse to miss. <laughs> yeah. Part of your class, are you going to implement like, um, I guess, like interview questions when you interview like cleaners? Of yeah, I, I throw in there a little bit. Um, I, I throw in a cleaning checklist, and, and then you you also want to ask them like, "Hey, do you have an order that you clean?" Because if they don't, they're like, "No, nah, I just go in." They, no, you don't want that. Like, well, you, you want someone that has a system. You want to be there to the cover. You know, no, that, that's usually on you. You yeah. need backup, <laughs> and so I would say in there like, you need a backup cleaner, backup handyman, because I, I have at least three handymen up there, and I've got two cleaners, and I've got a hot tub. Yeah. And what, what's the most common thing that we need to be in this you had so that put out there? Uh, the contractor work is hard. That, and so what the problem is, like with the handyman, for instance, um, they could only do so much, and if you need a specialty thing, like for instance, I need someone that does uh, stuff in crawl spaces, funny enough. And they're like, yeah, the closest guy is two hours away. 
And I was like, uh, all right. And then you're calling these people or like we had an issue with our HVAC and like, we, we found someone three hours away that, and, and they were like, you know, you have to be there to meet us. Like, yeah. Like I'm three hours away. Wonderful. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, so obviously you're bringing into the market that has become a total of mental mm -hmm. or long there. So you're going to be in competition like right away. I know obviously like high ratings are a big thing to help themselves. Yeah. Them time, but what else do you do? Like you're decorating the it, It's the professional photos that will separate you from everyone else. No one else has professional photos. And, and the walkthrough video. But uh, first, everyone sees the photos. So honestly, if you just have professional photos, it blows everyone else's photos. You'd be shocked all these homeowners just take photos from their phone or like live in the track. I'm like, what do you guys do? If I saw a picture like that with a thing, I would yeah. think that it was a scam. There, there's so many people that, that do that or like they'll take a photo of just like their chair. I'm like, why are well, you making I think like a big thing is that you are so heavy actively maintaining it, whereas people just want to set it up and forget about it. Well, and that's the thing is, I, I, in the very beginning, you do set it up and you do right. kind of forget about it. But like, I still physically go there all the time so I can check on it. Right. Um, but if I didn't want to, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have to go. But like, it's still to my standard that, hey, I want to make sure. You can't be better. Exactly. Like I even provide like the extra nice toilet paper, like the Charmin stuff. Like it, it, it all makes a difference, and it's all the little things. So like on every outlet, it's not just the outlet; it's the six prong with the two, um, the USB. Every single outlet, and it, it's just I want them to uh, not complain. In all the masters, they all have adjustable beds, so like you get the upper and the feet, and it's an experience. It like also not that yeah, exactly. You, you want to make it where you're getting these repeat customers. And now, like, I've got these repeats. Well, I've also upped all my prices. And so now, when I was making 30 grand from one, that same one is now making 39, where now it should make, like, 42 next year. So it's crazy that one is going from 30 to 42 because of the experience you create. And it does cost a little bit of extra money, but that money is well worth it. It's not like I'm buying a fancy pumpkin and put it in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Sorry, my voice is like this, but thank you all for coming. Appreciate you all.